Hi everyone, I am Josh Arents. I'm a naturalist with Arents Outdoors. I thought we would have a short lesson today on the senses of sight and hearing in birds of prey. And if things go well, maybe we'll make this into a short series of natural history lessons. Welcome to my backyard on a windy Montana spring day. Now before we get started, how about a brief introduction? I've been a naturalist now for almost 20 years. I began my career working with endangered species and birds in the southeast. Now I'm fortunate enough to call Montana home. I get lots of questions from people asking me to identify plants and animals that they encounter. And this time of year, the majority of questions that I get are in relation to birds of prey. There's a special fascination that people have with hawks, owls, falcons, and vultures that goes well beyond just about anything else I see. So today I thought we would look at the sight and hearing in birds of prey. Let's take a look at a couple of skulls and first of all let's see if we can identify who these skulls belong to and what features on these skulls tell us what senses are most important uh, to these animals. Let's begin with this skull right here. Uh, some of you may already have figured out what this is but let's let's talk about it and then work out who this might belong to. The first thing that jumps out at us is it's a decent sized skull. You know this is my hand. Uh, it's it's uh, about three quarters the size of my hand, uh, but this really strongly hooked, prominent, strong beak, yellow in color. Uh, what do we think this is for? This is for ripping and tearing, so we know this is a bird of prey. The next really big thing that jumps out at us are large eyes, incredibly large eyes. Now, for the size of this skull, which is markedly smaller than my, my big old head, our eyeballs are the same size. Now, if we see eyes that big and a skull this much smaller than, than a human head, uh, we know automatically that these eyes are radically important to this animal. Uh, as many of you may have figured out, <clears throat> with this really strong, yellow, powerful beak, uh, nice size head, this skull belongs to bald eagle. This is Haliatus leucocephalus. Now, besides this, we see these nostrils that are set well back into the uh, where the beak is, uh, but not really large in relation to the rest of the body. So we see sense of smell, probably not that important. But the thing that jumps out at us are these incredibly large eyes. Now, if you look, these eyes are, are held in place unlike anything that we see in mammals. Uh, mammals do not have these structures. These are called sclerotic rings. And what these, uh, what these rings uh, show us are that this bird has a eye that is not round like ours. We see this in creatures that do not have spherical shaped eyes. And indeed, uh, that is the case with bald eagle. Now most assuredly, the front of the eye is, is round uh, very much like ours is, where the uh, cornea and the uh, iris are in the lens. However, when we look at where the eye would come back behind this, it, begin, it begins to mushroom up and enlarge in shape into the back of the skull. They have really large eyes. And when we look at vision, whether it be in humans or whether it be in birds, we look at two structures in the eye to begin with. And those are rods and those are cones. Now cones uh, are our color sensing structures in our eyes. You can see it is color, and cones. R uh, is for low light, very poor color, uh, but picking up motion and sensing, uh, sensing things in low light. Rods are in reduced light. That's how you can remember that. C, cones, color, R, rods, reduced light. When we look at vision uh, in eagles, uh, we always talk about uh, Humans have 20-20 vision when they have perfect vision. What that means is you can see clearly at 20 feet what should be seen clearly at 20 feet. Um, when we look at uh, hawks, owls, uh, and eagles, and vultures, uh, we have to think about something different. Uh, if we were to break their vision down like our 20-20 vision, what we would see with this eagle is something on the line of a 20 five or a 24 vision. So what we see clearly at four feet, this eagle can see clearly at 20. Now let's extrapolate that back a little bit. This, this 
I, I don't need magic in the world when I have something like this. This is this is amazing. I don't need David Copperfield. This this will never not blow me away. Uh, eagles can see rabbits uh, twitching their ears uh, somewhere between one and a half to two and a half miles away. Uh, now to break it down a little better, um, and and I've I've read this once and it and it it was oh god it blew me away. If you had a bald eagle sitting on one field goal post at one side of a football field and you sat a dime on the other field goal post on the other side of the football field, uh, this eagle could read the date on that dime. And I think that's incredible for a number of reasons. Uh, one big one is how in the heck did this eagle learn how to read and who taught it what numbers mean to even care what a date on a dime is? Uh, but. When we look at, uh, at eyes also, uh, when our light comes in uh, and we detect color, uh, the place in the back of our eyeball that really matters is called the fovea. Uh, and in humans, it's this little teeny uh, dish-shaped area on the back of the, the eye with a really dense concentration of cones. With humans, that sits somewhere around 200,000 cones sitting in our fovea. Well, eagles have two fovea they have dual fovea and the one that sits at the back where uh, roughly where ours would sit uh, has uh, somewhere to the tune of uh, 1.2 million cones in there the other fovea sits off at about a 45 degree angle uh, kind of interior and that is what gives them what we uh, what we would refer to as their telescopic vision that gives them that that clarity um, of, of focus that is well beyond anything uh, that we're capable of. Now, the one thing that I really, really want to point out here is birds can see well beyond the spectrums that, uh, that we can. They can see well into the ultraviolet spectrum, uh, and that is really important with birds of prey uh, because animals leave scent, uh, scent trails, usually in urine. Um, and urine glows in ultraviolet light. My favorite bird, the American kestrel, makes a very good living hovering in fields and reading urine trails of small mice and rodents in a field. Uh, the brighter the glow of the urine, the more fresh the uh, scent marking by that rodent is, and they know that that is uh, where, that, uh, where that rodent will be for attack. Uh, with eagles, we see them soaring way up high. And their first cousin, the first cousin of bald eagle, the golden eagle, is superb at soaring way up high, well out of detection of rabbits, and coming down beyond the two mile mark, seeing where those rabbits are and coming in and, and striking. Uh, this is incredible. So a couple things we learned, uh, prominently uh, hooked beak, ripping and tearing, Nostrils set well back means sense of smell is not nearly as important. Really incredibly large eyes that mushroom out into the back of the skull held in close focus by these sclerotic rings. Now let's take a look at another skull. What we have here is a much smaller skull. Uh, you'll see in Overall size, this skull is much, much smaller uh, in comparison to that. But what we see are sclerotic rings that are way more prominent, uh, just jutting out. And if you look, can you see how this is concaving in? Um, this uh, belongs to a great horned owl. See this shorter but uh, stocky beak hooked on the end for ripping and tearing wider skull. This skull is squattier and wider uh, in shape uh, than that of the bald eagle. And that's important. I'm going to take this uh, dentura off, this this lower mandible. I'm going to take that off. That's not that important right this second. Uh, once again, we see uh, back beyond the beak, we see uh, nostrils coming in. Uh, but then once again, really, really large sclerotic rings uh, to hold a cylinder-shaped eye, uh, you know, the eagles uh, mushroomed into the back of the head. Uh, these guys are long eyeballs, cylindrical in shape, 
packed to the gill with rods. Uh, great horned owls hunt mostly at night. Uh, they can be active during the day. It's not uncommon, especially this time of year, uh, when they are feeding uh, chicks in the nest, uh, feeding owlets in the nest. Uh, they will be active uh, during the day, but most commonly active at night. And what do we uh, learn when we're talking about cones and rods? Rods are the uh, important structure for reduced light vision, for low light vision. Now, that tells us a couple things. Rods are really poor at picking up color. In fact, they don't really do it at all. Uh, so we, we can automatically assume that this bird doesn't see in quite as vivid color as a bald eagle, but this bird is able to pick up movement and any sort of, uh, any sort of behavior in incredibly low light. Now, owls cannot see in absolute darkness not in absolute darkness, but the smallest amount of light uh, can provide them with enough, uh, enough uh, influence on their rods that they can see movement. Starlight. Something as vague as starlight is enough for these guys to see. Now, we know owls are really good at hearing. And where I want to show you how this picks up is, uh, you see right here, uh, just under where the eyeball is uh, on the left side of this owl. Uh, that is where one of the ears uh, would be on this owl. And when we look over here, we don't see it sitting up nearly as high. Now here, that ear begins right behind this sclerotic ring, right up here. Over here, the opening for the ear is well below. Now. What that gives us is asymmetrical ears. Now, let's talk uh, a bit about mathematics, very briefly, uh, about mathematics. Uh, for those of you who have taken geometry and trigonometry, uh, we know that uh, triangulation uh, requires three locations. Uh, and if you want to use triangulation uh, to either judge distance, height, depth, the more offset two of those points are from the origin of another, the more well-defined you can nail down exactly where that is. Now, I've seen that in my career. I got my start as an intern uh, with the United States Air Force working with their endangered species on a bombing range. And there were two towers set up on this bombing range. Whenever uh, the planes would come in and drop their bombs, they would send up a, uh, a smoke uh, charge to show the location of where the bomb hit and the two towers would look and read the angles and the distance and they were uh, able to tell exactly where that uh, where that bomb landed. Now this is done in the exact same way except it's done uh, from an auditory sense. When you look at offset ears and we have offset ears too but not nearly as well uh, well offset as asymmetrical as these ears are when you get that sort of offset uh, distance of height on either side and depth on either side, what you're able to do is pinpoint precisely where sounds are coming from. Now, many of you that have seen owls out in the wild have noticed owls will bob their head, they'll tilt, they'll bob and look over and turn their heads. And what they're doing is they're, they're defining two things. Uh, first of all, they're nailing down the length of time that a sound takes to come to that right ear versus that left ear. Uh, they'll fine tune that down. And the other thing is uh, they, will, they will also do that to help fine tune where maybe some of that movement is being picked up with the eyes. Um, it, this is, this. Oh, again, I don't need David Blaine uh, when it comes to, to nature. All the magic that I could ever want is found right here uh, in this skull. Uh, so what we see are mathematical <laughs> facts being exhibited in the skull of a creature. Uh, triangulation, the, the change of time that it takes a sound to reach the right ear versus the left ear uh, is enough for, for this guy to be able to pinpoint exactly where sound's coming from. Now where I live here in Montana, we have a species of owl called great gray owl. 
This, of course, is great, horn, great horned owl, Bubo virginianus. Uh, but great gray owls uh, have really prominently uh, asymmetrical uh, set ears where they can hear movement of rodents under um, several inches of snow. Matter of fact, uh, you know, it goes you know, 18 or so inches, they can hear uh, rodents tunneling under the snow. So they can not only pinpoint where something's coming from, they can pinpoint how far down it's coming from. We also see that in barn owls. Um, Taito alba is the scientific name of barn owls. Barn owls are able to hunt uh, rodents in deep, deeper vegetation than uh, many others are. Now, if this bird were alive and, and I were holding it, you would notice these facial discs. Uh, and where the ears are on an owl, they don't have ear openings like us. Uh, they have really uh, strong bristles uh, around their facial discs that they're able to open. Um, and um, as a matter of fact, if we look uh, right here, we'll use this same area of the skull. Um, if you ever find, uh, if you're able ever to look at an owl up close, and I've been fortunate in my career that I've banded a number of uh, species of owls, um, if you were to open their ear flap up where, that, uh, where those uh, stronger uh, bristles are around that facial disc, if you were to pull it back, you would be able to see through that ear hole the back of their eyeball. That's how big their eye is. It goes all the way back to here. Uh, and man, if that's not incredible, I don't know what is. So we see uh, vision and hearing important in two species of birds of prey. Now, birds long ago began to focus evolutionarily on the sense of sight. Mammals, however, we focused on the sense of smell. And another species that I'd like to show you found here, and I know this is not a bird, but we're going to talk about the difference between evolutionary spe specialization of sight versus evolutionary specialization for mammals. We focused on the sense of smell. Now remember when we were looking at this bald eagle, the nostrils are set well back beyond where this beak starts. But if we look at this species of mammal that we have here up in Montana, this is a Canada lynx, lynx canadensis. The first thing we see besides these really great teeth are sitting right up front, a, a big old hole for pulling air in, sampling those scent molecules, running it through the olfactory system, uh, and detecting smell and following a trail. Uh, now, where we see this really, really displayed is in another species that we have here in my home state of Montana. We see it in grizzly bear. Look at that nasal opening. Oh man, we'll take this uh, man the bottom uh, jaw, this mandible off. Uh, you see this? Wow, that is, in relation to the size of the skull, this really jumps out at you. Now, what do you see here? We see this structure, these nasal turbinates that are, that are many, many more times uh, more uh, compressed in a grizzly nose than that of a human. This really large opening for pulling those scent molecules in and detecting where scents are coming from uh, is what gave mammals our superpower. Uh, however, you see it in this grizzly bear. Grizzlies are able to uh, detect scents and follow trails for smells that are coming 15 to 20 miles away. Oh man, that is incredible. Uh, we see pretty decently large eyes, really great teeth for pulling and grinding. But the thing that jumps out at us with both of these mammal skulls, whether it's a grizzly or a Canada lynx, the first thing that sits way out front and is most important is that nose uh, for the sense of smell. Again, we do not see that in birds. Now as a postscript, I want to add a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, there are birds that are capable of, uh, of, of smelling incredibly well turkey vultures being a, a species that can do that. Uh, in songbirds, the sense of hearing is not nearly as defined as in, uh, in owls, and that's for obvious reasons. Very small skulls like that found on these songbirds, warblers, vireos, 
uh, chickadees, titmice, nuthatches, etc. Uh, the the distance between uh, the ears is just not going to give them the capability of hearing nearly as well as a stocky, squatty, wide uh, uh, skull uh, found on owls. Um, finally, uh, those sclerotic uh, rings that we saw in the bald eagle and the great horned owl um, are 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 there in such a way that it does not allow them to move their eyes uh, one way or another, which is why you see them moving their heads. Um, and finally, if this is something you guys would like to, to see more of, uh, feel free to let me know. We may try to make this into a uh, short series.